speakers that both talk about a, um, a conflict that's going on in all of our genomes across all, really, kingdoms of life. Our first speaker is Dr. Julius Brennecke, who comes to us all the way from Institute for Molecular Biotechnology in, in Vienna. And, um, and, and so Julius really began his impressive career uh, in Stephen Cohen's lab as a graduate student where he discovered an oncogenic microRNA called Bantam, and, um, and as well as developing a lot of tools to predict, validate, and really understand how microRNAs find their targets and regulate their expression. For his uh, postdoc with Greg Hannon, um, he expanded his interest in small RNAs by a few nucleotides in either direction, studying the 21 nucleotide endo-siRNAs and the slightly bigger 24 nucleotide and up pyRNAs. Um, both of which turned out to be part of a, a really important um, adaptive immune system uh, present throughout the entire animal kingdom, uh, which he's going to talk about today. Um, Julius, in 2007, uh, published just a really important, one of my favorite papers on, on how clusters of transposons in the, in the fly genome can be um, turned into essentially an anti-transposon defense um, that was scalable. Um, RNA base and, and pass from mother to, to daughter. And the, his characterization, as well as other people's of this, of this really cool defense system, um, explained a, a, a very difficult um, epigenetic phenomenon that had, that had um, really uh, bothered fly geneticists for almost 30 years, that of this um, transposon-mediated hybrid dysgenesis. And so to me, it's just really impressive how much progress that he and his, and his group has made in, in, in solving a really difficult problem. Um, and, and he does so, as you'll appreciate, using a variety of approaches, uh, cell biology, genetics, um, next generation sequencing, and just you know, really thought out uh, controls and great experiments to, to, re to really make quick work of this. And, and so I don't want to give too much away, but today he's going to talk about exactly how the fly uh, can actually turn something that's deleterious to it, uh, a transposon uh, pest into, into a defense against it. And so uh, we're really thrilled that he could make it here all the way from Vienna, and thank you for coming. I'm having really a great time here. It's my first time to Baltimore, and I really enjoyed uh, also being here at this institute. It seems to be a, a really wonderful place. So. Um, I hope at the end of my talk it gets clear what I mean with this hacking the gene expression machinery. Um, basically, by as Steve uh, mentioned, we are, we are interested in uh, this sort of arms race between host genome and transposable elements. And by studying this, mostly from a genetics perspective, we really stumbled across some very fascinating examples how evolution has duplicated certain genes and then co-opted them uh, for this uh, arms race. And I think our concept is by, by understanding these molecular principles, we also might understand much more about the ancestral core gene expression factor, but more to that later. Now, by, by training, I'm a developmental geneticist, and I think this is actually uh, the book that got me hooked to Drosophila research. I read that during my undergrad times, and I found it so absolutely fascinating how you can use a model system to understand core concepts of signaling gene expression development. And I think like many developmental biologists, we are getting really impressed by how the genome uh, is, is being turned on and turned off in, in enormously accurate patterns during development in terms of space uh, and time. And that somehow conveys this idea of the so-called harmonic genome, where everything is nicely in place. You have enhancers, coding sequences, introns, terminators, um, so, so that you, you can orchestrate this beautiful gene expression um, patterns. But as a matter of fact, our genomes are, as we all know, uh, everything but harmonic. They're actually a, a, literally a huge battlefield of, of selfish genetic elements, such as transposons and uh, the host genome. And I want to show you uh, two uh, very impressive examples um, of genome intruders. The first one uh, is bacteriophages. 
which uh, infect bacterial cells. And our, um, this phage, uh, phage infection cycle actually turns over about a quarter of the entire biomass in our oceans every day. So, I mean, this, uh, this is an incredible uh, uh, process that's going on there. And uh, as, as we have all experienced over the last 10 years or so, an incredible string of uh, discoveries uh, have laid down now uh, a very sophisticated defense system on the bacterial side, which is called CRISPR-Cas, that, that, that basically uh, protects uh, bacterial cells against these invasions. Now, this is uh, between two, if you want, two genomes fighting. But you, we also have uh, fight intragenomes. And a very impressive example is uh, shown here. This is the human genome, uh, the, the human chromosomes. And in red, you see DNA. And in green, uh, you see a single transposable element, the ALU element, uh, stain. So there, there are over a million copies uh, in the human genome. This is a, a primate-specific transposon. So at some point in primate evolution, something crazy must have happened so, so that this element uh, was able to uh, multiply in such uh, enormous ways. By now, most of these transposons are dead, uh, and the others are under, under quite tight control. So how, how this genome defense system is, is working and adapting to this challenge is, is really the, the key question in, in my lab. And so this is essentially an arms race. And to me, the, the, the most interesting aspect about an arms race is actually this accelerated evolution. Because uh, if, if this guy wouldn't evolve uh, the weapon, uh, probably you would not have any type of evolution here as well. So what's, what's going on in this, in this very dynamic um, uh, arms race is, is it's, it's an accelerated evolution, and we will hear much more about this later from, from actually the true experts. Uh, my, before I come to what we actually work on in the lab, I want to I wanna quickly share two review articles that I really found extraordinarily. I mean, I'm try, trying to catch up in this field because, as I've pointed out, I'm coming from developmental genetics. And so I'm, I'm, I'm reading uh, reviews, and these are really two of my, my most favorite reviews uh, that I've read so far. The first one is from Nina Fedorov, who actually uh, used to work here at the Carnegie, where she makes an, an enormously interesting point that it's not just this arms race, uh, so that actually the defense systems that uh, help to suppress transposons are probably responsible for the fact that we have these huge genomes in the first place. Because without these genome defense systems, you wouldn't be able to accumulate so many repetitive sequences in your genome. You would have homologous recombination all over the place. And you, our genomes would actually literally fall apart. So having genome defense systems is probably responsible for having these huge genomes. These huge genomes, in fact, on the other hand, are responsible for uh, having, I think, very fast adaptation and evolution. And the second. Very interesting piece is uh, from Hidden Madani, where he uh, points out that maybe many things of the eukaryotic gene expression pathways, like we have a nuclear membrane, we have export of the mRNA, we have splicing. Many of these things might, in fact, have come from the necessity to distinguish our own gene expression programs from parasitic gene expression programs. If you think about a virus that sits in the, in the host genome, and that virus, a retrovirus, wants to be exported at some point in order to make a new infectious particle. This virus needs to export an unspliced mRNA or an unspliced RNA. The cellular machinery doesn't allow that. So the virus needed to find a trick to, to overcome this. And I will show you later uh, how this actually works. All right. We study this uh, genome conflict uh, in the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, which I think in this field, because of its, actually, this is, fly research is very interesting in this aspect, because I think it's this transposon defense system, the pyrene pathway, is literally at the crossroads of three fields that are colliding. The first field is developmental genetics. People have been uh, found it very fascinating to understand how uh, gametes, in this case, the oocyte, is being formed and patterned, et cetera, et cetera. Many genes that have been found genetically to affect oocyte polarity now turn out to be pyrene pathway genes. 
because if you hit the pyrene pathway, you have genome, uh, you have genome um, uh, the DNA defects, and those lead to pattern defects. The second field is there has been always a, a, a few people working on transposable element logic, uh, mostly in, in France, uh, but also in Russia, and of course also in this country here. But the, the, these people have used the Drosophila uh, ovary to understand uh, transposome biology. Of course, that is now tightly connected to the pyrene field. And then more, more later came people that were just fascinated by small RNAs. I mean, they, they, they figured there are small RNAs, and there are, some of them are gonad specific. And so these people, and this is basically where I come from, uh, started to come into this field as well. Drosophila is certainly one of the key model systems uh, in this pyrene research where, where you can really combine genetics, genomics uh, in, in very uh, powerful manners. Now, in a nutshell, the pyrene pathway uh, resembles very much a CRISPR-Cas system. So if you think about it, you have uh, an effector protein called an argonaut protein, which is uh, loaded with a small RNA. And the small RNA will guide this effector protein to either a nascent transcript in the nucleus, and then you can do uh, transcriptional gene silencing via chromatin, heterochromatin formation, or to a cytoplasmic transcript where you can literally destroy the RNA in, in a process called post-transcriptional gene silencing. This small RNA comes from geno uh, genomic small RNA source loci. These are dedicated loci in the genome which encode the information to make small RNAs. So you have a first very important step, which is small RNA biogenesis and loading. This is where you have to really discriminate your own RNAs from the uh, transposon RNAs. You have a second step, which is called targeting. And you have a third step, which is up here, where you have acquisition and adaptation. These genomic source loads can be changed according to the transposon uh, load that, that, that a species is experiencing. And those three aspects are precisely the same concepts in CRISPR-Cas systems. And so I think this is why these pathways actually are so successful in evolution. Uh, be simply because they can very quickly adapt to any type of intruder by just sticking the sequence of the intruder itself into the genomic RNA source loss or small RNA source loss. And so these are the three fields that we study uh, uh, in, in my lab. And just a very, very brief uh, overlay, uh, 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 summary here. So this is small RNA biogenesis. We are using genetics and deep sequencing and computational biology to understand the concepts of how you make a small RNA. It's a fascinating process. I don't want to talk about it today. Uh, but it, it, it seems as if this is actually really pretty much hardwired. We find very similar concepts, ranging from sponges to human. So it looks like that this is a pretty ancient machinery uh, that, that there are variations on it, but the core seems to be very much conserved. And there are two processes that happen on, on, on chromatin. One process is where a nuclear PV protein is attached to a nascent transcript, and I actually think in a magic process is able to form heterochromatin at this locus. It's a fascinating process. Again, I don't want to talk about it today. I want to talk about the biology of these genomic source loci that we also call pyronic clusters. This seems to be the, much, the most fluid system. Uh, we have, uh, we and others, uh, like Bill Therkov's lab or Alexei Aravin's lab, Greg Hannon's lab, have discovered a bunch of factors. I think we are now zooming in on five, six, seven, uh, or eight factors, which are required for the biology of these genomic source loci. Most of these factors are not conserved even outside of drosophilids. This is a very fast evolving biology. And I mean, if, if Thomas Hunt Morgan wouldn't have chosen Trosophila Menogasta more than 100 years ago as a model system. We wouldn't even know about any of this. Might, maybe we would have known another very exciting system. Uh, but so I really wonder how much biology is out there that we don't even have any clue about. All right, so let's zoom in onto these genomic pyrene source laws. I want to first uh, show you how these look like. So back in 2007, when Alexei Aravin and myself were uh, postdoc in Greg Hannon's labs, a postdocs in Greg Hannon's lab, we sequenced small RNAs. Back then, still with 454 sequencing, we were very proud to have 30,000 sequences. You know yourself that this has changed dramatically. But this actually was enough to show that the genome contains sort of hotspots where these small RNAs come from. 
And we call these hotspots pioneer clusters. And the very first odd thing was they typically were sort of at the border between euchromatin and heterochromatin. And you also could see that some of these clusters seem to make pi RNAs from both genomic strands. So they map to the Watson strand and to the Crick strand, if you wish. Whereas other loci seem to make pi RNAs only from one genomic strand. And so this really early on defined clusters as either unistrand or dual strand. This, for example, is a unistrand cluster. This is the most famous pyrene cluster in Drosophila. It was discovered genetically by positional cloning before the Drosophila genome was published, before RNAi was discovered. This is a truly heroic effort by Alain Boucheton and Alain Pelleson's lab. The cluster is called Flamenco. Uh, this Flamenco cluster is about 200 kilobases, 300 kilobases in length. It's full of transposon sequences. They are all oriented in one orientation. Uh, namely in the antisense orientation to the transcription direction, so that the small RNAs that are being produced from this cluster are all antisense to active element mRNAs. Uh, this cluster throughout its entire length will make pi RNAs. These gaps that you see here are truly bioinformatic, if you wish, artifacts, because these are areas where the small RNAs would map to multiple sites in the genome. And they're called multi-mappers, and we don't show them here. Now, these dual-strand clusters are actually quite fascinating from just looking at them because clearly RNA pol 2 which is the responsible polymerase to transcribe them, must transcribe these sites on both genomic strands, something that pol 2 actually cannot really do. All right. So let's have a look at these dual strand clusters. Actually, may maybe one small word about these unistrand clusters. They are actually relative, it turns out that they seem to be relatively simple. It looks like that they are resembling canonical genes. You have a single promoter right at the beginning with enhancers. These clusters can be spliced. It really looks like they are more or less normal gene expression units. I still think they are very fascinating in, in, in their biology. We, we made genetic screens and we found a bunch of very interesting factors that seem to be required for, polymer, for the polymerase to go through this huge juggle of transposons. So there are tran some transcription elongation factors, some factors involved in RNA export that I think are very interesting uh, entry points to understand, understand the logic of Pol2 transcribing such a big, messy locus. I want to focus the talk uh, pretty much exclusively on these dual-strand clusters. So let's have a quick look at them. This is small RNA sequencing. So by sequencing small RNAs, in this case pi RNAs, we can tell uh, there, there is a hotspot of small RNA production. It's dual-stranded, as you see here. But if you look at certain other chromatin marks, it's actually quite surprising. First of all, this cluster clearly sits within heterochromatin. So this is H3K9 trimethyl. It's a very strong heterochromatic mark. And in the contrast to these flanking genes, whose promoters have very clear uh, stalled RNA pol 2 peaks and H3K4 uh, methyl peaks associated to them, we don't find any promoter, uh, that, like any hint of a promoter that might drive these clusters, and neither do we find any mark for a promoter chromatin like H3K4 methyl. So it really was very unclear how, you, how RNA polymerase II can initiate transcription in, in these clusters. And the key to understand, or so, so I get a foothold into this biology as so often comes from genetics. So uh, there has been a protein called Rhino, or a gene called Rhino, that was discovered genetically. Our MITS lab has uh, uh, studied, studied this gene for a while and really made very interesting observations that this gene is under very strong positive selection. And then Bill Ferkov's lab at UMass in Worcester uh, made the, the breakthrough uh, uh, discovery that this Rhino protein is actually enriched at these dual-strand clusters and nowhere else in the genome. There's a one-to-one -one correlation. Wherever you find Rhino sitting on chromatin, you will have one of these dual-strand pyrene clusters. Rhino is an HP1 family protein. It's fast evolving, and it's actually very unclear how this protein gets recruited specifically to these sites and not to many other sites that are also uh, showing the H3K9 trimethyl mark. Let's have a, a quick look at, 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 at the cell biology of Rhino because it's actually a super useful tool. 
So if you look at, this is a, a Drosophila egg chamber, which has somatic cells uh, out here, and these huge germline nuclei shown here, those are endoreplicated polyploid cells. And if you look at rhino protein, here, this is chief P rhino, you see that this protein makes these very distinct foci within these germline nuclei. Those foci, by every experiment we have done so far, must be the pyrenic, the pyrenic clusters themselves. So wherever you see a rhino focus, this is where you will have one of these pyrenic clusters. One experiment is, is shown here. For example, here this is uh, uh, rhino shown again, and this is a single molecule RNA fish for one of the major pyrenic clusters. And so you see that these two signals very nicely overlap. Of course, rhino has other areas in the nucleus where it binds, because this is just one of these pyrenic clusters. But wherever you find a 42AB pyrenic cluster spot, there will be a rhino focus. That's, of course, not true outside of the nucleus, where you see this 42AB RNA also accumulating outside of the nucleus. And this is the site of biogenesis, and we'll come to that later. All right, so the loss of rhino has a very strong phenotype. If you get rid of rhino, the pyrene production from these sites entirely collapses. So does, in fact, the transcription of these sites. So, of course, these areas in the genome must be transcribed because they give rise to pyrenees. And if you look at the wild-type situation, there's a, a sort of a, a squizzle of, of, of RNA-seq signal, and that completely depends on rhino. So somehow, the HP1 protein rhino, belonging to a family of proteins which make heterochromatin, seems to be sort of an activator of transcription, because if you get rid of this protein, you shut down transcription in this pyrene cluster area. And so the model that is currently entertained in the field is that rhino, by virtue of its uh, uh, chromodomain, will bind H3K9 trimethyl marks at clusters and will recruit a bunch of effector proteins which trick the endogenous gene expression machinery into productive transcription within heterochromatin. So something that shouldn't happen is being enforced by rhino. And I think it's very interesting to understand the logic of these different um, proteins or uh, processes up here. And so just to, to very briefly illustrate you the concept, I want to start with a story that Laszlo uh, Tyrion and Peter, uh, Peter Anderson in the lab, two postdocs, have spearheaded over the last few years. And since it's published, I just want to give you the punchline uh, of that story. And this is about how you start transcription initiation within heterochromatin. For the second story, which then is dealing with RNA export, uh, Peter uh, teamed up with uh, a PhD student in the lab, Mosti uh, El Magrabi, and a master student who's, who's uh, also uh, helping them. Now, I mentioned to you that the cytology, so just simply looking at rhino in these nuclei is a super good tool to look at pyrenic clusters. And so we did genetic screens and found se several genes that are required for transposon silencing and then did a very simple experiment. We simply asked, where do they localize? And we found a bunch of proteins that co-localize with rhino in these nuclei. So these are very good candidates for the biology of this of these pyrenic clusters. And one of them really caught our attention. We call this protein now Moonshiner, because Moonshiner, by bioinformatic analyses, resembles TF2A. Now, TF2A, I just learned outside, was actually discovered here, uh, is a basal transcription initiation factor. How does it look like? Every RNA polymerase, one, two, and three, requires a set of very basal transcription initiation factors, and amongst them is actually TF2D with the core component TBP. And TBP gets positioned on DNA and, uh, and stabilized by a, a, a heterodimer called TF2A, which consists of TF2A S, small, and L, large. And it turns out that Moonshiner is, is, is a, a copy of TF2A L and has been repurposed for the pyrene pathway. This is literally the heart of eukaryotic transcription initiation. And so the model that came out of this paper is that uh, 
If you look at canonical gene expression, you have um, DNA sequences within enhancers which recruit transcription factors. And these transcription factors, by multiple different mechanisms, will in the end recruit the basal initial transcription initiation machinery, and you will have pre-initiation complex formation at the core promoter, and then transcription will, will start to fire. This moonshiner pathway that we discovered seems to uh, sort of hijack the same logic, but it recruits the initiation machinery directly to chromatin via chromatin marks rather to, than to DNA marks because those are probably occluded by the histones in, in the first place. So we like this as a concept because it re really resembles a pathway in plants where you also have small RNA-mediated transposon silencing where another chromatin uh, protein called SHH1 recruits a sister protein of RNA pol 2 in plants which is called pol 4 And so it looks like that this concept of recruiting the core transcription initiation machinery to heterochromatin is something that evolution has sort of discovered multiple times. And so the idea now is that this is why these clusters lack defined promoters. They literally recruit POL2 initiation within the heterochromatin and then just it's, it starts transcribing on both genomic strands. And Bill Ferko's lab has very nicely shown that the splicing of all of these cluster transcripts is strongly suppressed, so there's no splicing. And we have shown, and also Alexei Aravin's lab has shown, that cleavage polyadenylation of these cluster transcripts is also suppressed. So, I think we have a handle to study how these cluster, how, cl how cluster transcription is initiated. It's a very interesting question, how does this block of splicing and the block of termination and the elongation within heterochromatin occur? This is a very poorly understood question at the moment. But I want to show you in the, in the remaining time what we have learned about RNA export. Now, why do you have to export these RNAs in the first place? That is because the pi RNA biogenesis machinery is a strictly cytoplasmic event. So there's a clear separation between transcribing these precursors and, uh, and, and, and processing them. And that's seen quite impressively, I think, by, by this immunofluorescence uh, uh, image. Here again is Rhino. It's a strictly nuclear protein, and it occupies these pi RNA clusters throughout the genome. And here is Vasa an RNA helicase, which is a cytoplasmic protein, which accumulates just outside of the nuclear envelope in these blobs, whatever they are, maybe phase separated. I mean, that seems to be a big thing nowadays. So VASA is a core pyrene biogenesis machinery protein, and that sits just outside of the nuclear envelope. Those are the processing centers. If you do, again, one of these cluster in situ uh, experiments, you see that RNA cluster transcripts are detectable within the nucleus. These are, again, the sites of transcription. But then you find these RNAs also very nicely lining the nuclear envelope at the cytoplasmic phase. So how do they get out? So what do we know about RNA export in the first place? Extrapolating from me, uh, I give you a little bit of a primer into mRNA export because I didn't know much about it and I was surprised. I mean, whenever I talk to people about mRNA export, it seems that many other people also don't know so much about it. I find it it's a fascinating process. Without mRNA export, the cell drops dead within a day or so. Uh, but, but it looks like that this process is actually, uh, though heavily studied mostly in yeast, still a, a bit obscure. If RNA RNA polymerase II makes a transcript within the nucleus, which needs to be exported as a mature mRNA, we know that there is a bunch of requirements for the RNA exporter to accept this message as a substrate or as a cargo. mRNAs need to be 5' cap modified. Splicing must have occurred. That typically leads to the deposition of the splice of the exon junction complex. And the mRNA must be polyadenylated. These are the requirements for a factor called uh, NXF1, NXT1, it's a heterodimeric protein, to accept this mRNA after quality control as cargo, and then it shuttles it out into the cytoplasm. Now, the NXF1 protein and the NXT1 protein, as I mentioned, this is a heterodimer. The NXF1 protein is the key factor here. It has an, an N-terminal RNA binding unit. 
And these two domains are probably important for nuclear core complex binding. So we first uh, asked relatively bluntly, do we find any evidence for this protein uh, dimer to export pyrene cluster transcripts? So we again looked in these egg chambers. Here is a nucleus where you find the rhino uh, uh, marking uh, clusters. And this is NXF1 GFP, the mRNA exporter in cells. And you don't really find any accumulation at these clusters. Maybe expected, maybe not. However, if we look at the heterodimeric partner protein NXT1, which in the literature is sort of married to NXF1, wherever you have NXF1, you have NXT1, you find that this protein has a dramatically different localization. It also has a rim that's probably the nuclear pore complex uh, itself. But in addition, it lights up all of these pyrene clusters as if NXT1 has a separate life uh, from NXF1 when it comes to pyrene cluster biology. So we used this uh, a fly which has a GFP tagged NXT1 and did a, a mass spec on it. We identify the bait uh, if we tag NXT1 N terminally or C terminally. We find NXF1, the mRNA exporter, and then we find a sister protein of NXF1 called NXF3. And NXF3 is actually very interesting. It's uh, clearly expressed more or less exclusively in the ovary in contrast to its partner sister protein NXF1. And so we therefore wondered uh, whether that protein might be the, the responsible uh, exporter. So we generated a bunch of tools. We generated with CRISPR uh, a homozygous uh, uh, a knockout allele. And we also created a knock-in allele, which has at the endogenous site uh, a GFP uh, tag in it. And we used this GFP NXF3 uh, transgene to, to look at NXF3. And as you see, it beautifully localizes two pyrene clusters uh, according, uh, or it looks like that it localizes two pyrene clusters. And to show you this in more detail, I'll show you here a nucleus. This is a DAPI staining. We also look at the nuclear envelope. This is uh, stained for nuclear pores. And then we use the computer to just draw a line at the at, uh, at, at the center of this uh, poor signal to then go through the other channels. So this is rhino, again, a protein that localizes to these foci within the nucleus. And this, you see those foci here. And this is NXF3 GFP. Again, you see exactly the same uh, clusters lighting up. But in addition, you see that there is a very clear GFP signal outside the nucleus uh, lining the, the envelope. And so if you, if you actually do a co-staining with VASA, again, this is RHINO, the site of transcription. This is VASA, the site of pyrene biogenesis. NXF3 bridges those two compartments. So you find NXF3 signal at the clusters, but also at these VASA foci. So that's the first protein that actually might link transcription in the nucleus to biogenesis in the cytoplasm. It might not only export the transcripts, it might actually also confer specificity to the process by delivering rhino transcripts directly to the machinery. All right, uh, so in a nutshell, the idea would be that rhino recruits this export machinery, and that, again, helps uh, these aberrant transcripts to get out of the nucleus. And just to just briefly in the last few slides, I want to show you some strong evidence that this seems to be uh, the case. If in, in rhino mutants, I mentioned to you pyranase from these clusters collapse. In NXF3 mutants, you have a, a not as dramatic, but very, very strong reduction in pyranase uh, production from these sites as well. Transposons are strongly derepressed, and these NXF3 mutant flies are sterile. And when we look at uh, these, and when we use this cluster in situ uh, experiment uh, again to measure export, we can, in wild type, we see sites of production, but also sites of biogenesis in the cytoplasm. In NXF3 mutants, the production seems to be unperturbed, but we really don't find much uh, of cytoplasmic signal. And you can nowadays, of course, very well quantify this uh, in, these, uh, in these microscopes. So rhino leads to a collapse of transcription and, of course, also to the cytoplasmic signal. NXF3 transcription is unchanged, but in the cytoplasm, you find hardly any uh, RNA. And in a, in a final experiment, we, we did a RIP, which is simply you pull on, on your protein of interest, in this case, NXF3, 
and you ask what type of RNAs are bound to this. An experiment that I don't know how, I mean, I, it's the first time we do this, uh, did this RIP experiment and I was a bit skeptical, but it's actually for this protein absolutely incredible. Uh, throughout the entire genome, we find wherever you find a, a, a pyrene cluster, a dual strand cluster, uh, NXF3 seems to bind these precursors with an enormous affinity in, 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 in stark contrast to the control. So in summary, I mentioned uh, to you that transcripts produced by the polymerase uh, have to be exported with dedicated proteins because no RNA, no RNA by itself is able to traverse the nuclear pore complex. And so there are these dedicated export machineries. And it seems that uh, flies have evolved this NXF3, NXT1 shortcut for pyrene cluster transcripts. So why did they do this? And the, the answer or the reason is most likely because cluster transcripts violate all the three requirements for mRNA export. They are not spliced. They are most likely not polyadenylated. At least we don't find any sign of polyadenylation. And it seems that they have replaced the cap binding complex with another protein uh, binding the cap. So they resemble by no means an mRNA, meaning that the canonical mRNA exporter will say, no, thank you very much, I don't export you. And so therefore, flies have probably evolved this, uh, uh, this, this by path, path pathway. And we find that very interesting because viruses, as I mentioned in the beginning, face a very similar problem in their life cycle. At some point, a virus needs to be exported as an unspliced, unprocessed RNA. And so they have actually evolved very clever tricks. They have evolved these hairpins. And there are two different sort of types of these hairpins. One hairpin binds the NXF1 reporter, uh, exporter directly. And another one, for example, in, in HIV, binds REF, the HIV-encoded REF protein, which, in, which recruits the cellular master exporter CREM1. That is the most powerful protein exporter that cells have. And so by recruiting this machinery, they shuttle their unspliced, unprocessed RNA out of the cell. And we find this an analogy very, very interesting because it seems that nature has des like designed a similar concept for pyrene cluster transcripts. And it's actually very interesting. We found that NXF3 also requires CREM1 for export. So in summary, it seems as if Rhino is a hub to sort of hack the gene expression machinery. And so it, you are, you're recruiting transcription initiation, probably transcription elongation machinery, and RNA export machinery to heterochromatin in order to allow productive transcription from these sites. And it's very interesting to see that several of the involved proteins are actually sister proteins of deeply conserved ancient gene expression factors. And so this is where the idea of gene hacking came from. Peter, the lead uh, person in this entire uh, domain is a Scandinavian, and he uh, figured that there is actually something called IKEA hacking. So IKEA hacking is actually very interesting. There's really, there's a, there's a group of people that are calling themselves IKEA hackers. They take IKEA furniture and disassemble it and reassemble it in, with, in, uh, into different uh, uh, things. And so the duplication and repurposing is what we mean with gene hacking. And we do consider that this is actually a much more uh, general phenomenon. It's very interesting to see that TF2A, TF2D, but also NXF proteins have been multiplied several times in different animal lineages. And so these multiplications of NXF proteins, for example, ha happened independently in flies and independently in mammals. And so we, we, we speculate that there are sort of sweet spots in the gene expression cascade where you can duplicate and re repurpose factors quite effectively. So with this, I would like to conclude by thanking the team. It has been really, this is a, a, a wonderful place to do research with some really wonderful uh, people. The, the, the IMBA Institute is part of the Vienna Biocenter. I, I think one of the most interesting places to do basic science funded uh, and good funded research uh, in Europe. Uh, and I would really like to thank you for your attention.
Sorry, oh, I was wondering if hold on, use the mic. Use the mic. Oh, use the mic. Sorry. Uh, I was just wondering if by having sort of a specific uh, export machinery, if that's allowing you to more efficiently sort of couple like the transport of the um, transpose on messages to like sites of processing and along the nuclear membrane, like the along the nuage. Do you have any evidence that there's sort of a, a bridging through this complex? Right. I, I think this is a, a very interesting yet open question. So NX F1, the mRNA exporter, is actually getting disassembled from its cargo as soon as it exits, at least this is the literature, as soon as it exits the pore. Because there's a, an RNA helicase attached to the cytoplasmic part of the pore, which sort of disassembles it from the, from the cargo. Therefore, you never find NX, like much NXF1 protein in the cytoplasm. However, NXF3, as I, as I showed you, has very clear cytoplasmic localization within this nuage. This is why we think it actually uses CREM1 as export <coughs> machinery, because that allows it probably to stay bound to the cargo. Now, whether NXF1 or an, an associated factor, because actually NXF1 binds another RNA pathway factor that I haven't shown you here, whether either of these two proteins is sort of the delivery machinery or the tag to tell the cell make pyranase out of this transcript is very well possible. Uh, we would like to test it. It's not that trivial. However, there is a, a second way how the cell very, very effectively discriminates transposon transcripts from cellular mRNAs, and that's the act of PV-mediated slicing itself. And so you can actually turn any mRNA in the cell into a pyranase-producing RNA by just adding a single site for a PV protein. And that will trigger the cleavage of this RNA, and the remaining part of the RNA will be funneled into RNA biogenesis. So there, there might be two systems, how you get an RNA into this biogenesis machinery. And it's possible that NXF3, with its uh, bound partner protein, is playing a part uh, in this biology. Yeah. So great talk. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. One one has to do with uh, obviously the level of expression of these clusters is very much lower than the levels seen in surrounding exons of neighboring right. genes, and that would of course be consistent with the fact that it's part of heterochromatin. But um, in order to for RNA polymerase two to start transcription, you pretty much have to remove a nucleosome, I think. So I'm, I'm wondering what you know about that and also what you can tell us about um, whether start sites are positioned in any way or they're completely random. Uh, and similarly, what can you tell us about the length and the end? And finally, you alluded to the fact that they were capped. Is that, is that true or not true? Yeah, these are a bunch of super interesting questions. So, um, <laughs> the complexity you mentioned at the very beginning, at least when you take entire ovaries, which are easy to dissect, the levels of these transcripts is extraordinarily low compared to all other RNA. However, I think that is predominantly because if you take an ovary, the vast majority of the material are late-stage egg chambers, which have hardly any active transcription compared to the huge size of the egg. That's why I think there's a, such a skewing uh, in terms of levels. But nevertheless, they are definitely not expressed or present at, at super high levels. The second clear complexity is, and that relates to one of your questions, is what, where do they start, where do they end? They are being processed as soon as they hit the cytoplasm. So if this is not so trivial, we would need to, to sort nuclei. That is possible, and we, we are about to do this. Uh, but I think the NXF3 mutation is actually the most interesting experimental approach here because in NXF3 mutant, uh, or even better, in, in NES mutants of NXF3, we are expecting to accumulate the transcripts in the nucleus. And then we would probably for the first time really be able to measure and uh, to look accurately at beginning and end. The beginning is actually not so difficult to look at because at least they have a modification which renders them uh, not degradable by a normal 5 prime, 3 prime exon. So by, we as, therefore assume they are capped, because you can, you can use the same protocols that are being done, that are being developed for cap sequencing on these cluster transcripts. And if you do that, you find initiation sites throughout the entire cluster. We believe that they are initiation sites because 
they are having the YR initiator motive. Right? So it's not as pronounced as an mRNA encoding transcription start sites, but there's a very clear YR pattern at the plus one position, which is why we think they are probably modified, probably capped. Uh, and there's one protein genetically identified which, which resembles a cap quality control factor, but all the active site residues have been mutated. And that, we speculate, is sitting on the cap and preventing the cap binding complex from coming in. But that's a speculation in the field. This protein is called cutoff, and it's related to the very ancient Ri1 cap quality control factor. I'm sorry. Julius, do you know this interesting thing that you alluded to, the rhino, what really makes rhino only bind its regular nine marks on clusters? Do you know anything about the competition with the other HP1? Yeah, Any that's a very interesting question. So uh, uh, I think the field really, the field has, no, of course, the field knows this question since several years. How come that rhino sits only at some H3K9 sort of sites in the genome and not at others? because others look just the same. They also are full of transposon sequences. They have K9 metal levels. How come that it's not there? I have actually not any good explanation for this. Um, the competition with the other canonical HB1 factor is a very interesting one. If you, if you take just the chromo domain and measure the affinity to K9 methyl, it's similarly, I would say, medium to lousy. We're talking about 5 to 10 micromolar. Uh, for both of these proteins. So there's, but the, the canonical HP1 protein, I think, is probably much, much more abundant in these cells. So how come that Rhino is able to compete against a much more abundant sister protein that has a similar affinity to K9? It could mean that the way how you get Rhino to the site is actually not via the K9 mark, but via something else that we don't understand. And the K9 mark is just helping it to stay there or to make it more robust. Um, but these are all speculations we don't know. Yeah. Well, if you take out the, right, if you take out the canonical HP1, the, the, the cell is dying. So yeah, so, so far this has been only the, to an, this is not easy to answer because ovaries have somatic cells and germline cells. And in somatic cells, this entire rhino biology doesn't take place. So it could be that, yes, you can chip HP, canonically chip, uh, uh, you can chip canonical HP1 to these clusters. But whether that is from the germline cells or from somatic cells is not so easy. We have, we have now generated actually a, a, a cell culture system for germline cells that's clean. And there you can also chip HP1 to clusters, but it seems to be much lower than in other areas where you don't have rhino. I think one more question. I was wondering how, how the number of rhino um, speckles changes from cell to cell, and if, it, if that tells you something about the history of that cell. Right. You know, like what was, what was trying to get at it. So. Right. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. The complexity here is that these germline, th these germline nuclei that I'm showing here are <coughs> endoreplicated. At, these, at the late stages, they contain up to 500 or even sometimes 1,000 copies of the, of, of, of the genome. And so how many of these sister chromatids are still attached? How many, are, how many loci would you expect in the first place? This is actually really tricky. And it's, it, since there are so many copies, it's very well possible that some are not even active and only some of them have bo uh, rhino bound. So I think it's a, a very interesting but tricky question. All right, thank you.